we've got three very distinguished panelists who I'll introduce in just a minute who are going to help us explore this question of the call to adventure, how it comes, how do we respond, how do we take advantage, what are the fears sometimes that come along with that. So I did a little bit of research. I'm learning a lot myself in this whole understanding of hero's journey. I'm finding it really, really informative. There's multiple versions of the hero's journey from the research that I did. And some of them say there's 12 steps to it. Some of them say five. Remember those of you that were here last night, uh, Yogeshwar put some drawings up there and some of them looked somewhat simple and easy to comprehend. And then he showed a second one. It looked like you needed a master's degree to kind of work your way through the different steps that were involved. So there's different analysis of the, this hero's journey, but all of them, had this same phase, the call to adventure. It seems this is a really critical aspect of it. So this is one of the ones that, that we pulled out, the devotees that were planning the, this, this, this weekend together, we pulled out as something that was essential that really needed to be looked at uh, from a Christian conscious perspective. Um, sometimes they describe in simple terms, the hero at this stage begins a situation of normality from which some information is received that acts as a call to head off into the unknown. Radhika Raman talked about this earlier uh, this morning, U.S. morning time. Often this journey is represented, or the call, by a distant land, a forest, a kingdom underground, beneath the waves, above the sky. We would say out of the universe, right? The call comes from out of the universe. <clears throat> and the hero then can choose to go forward or sometimes says, I don't know if I can do that. And I think we see sometimes in our devotional lives, the call to adventure came and we said no. And then it came again, perhaps, and we said no. And eventually we, we, we say, okay, I'll give it a try. And a lot of times it's because Krishna out of his mercy kind of has the other options fall out of our lives. I, I heard this in a conversation that I had with Yugo Kishore the other day, and he's going to be sharing with us a couple minutes. So this call to adventure comes, how we respond to it as devotees, and of course, particularly looking here as men, is such an important thing for us to look into. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we got three devotees, all three of whom I consider very good friends. And um, although some are younger than me, I would say that I would also consider them mentors to myself because they've inspired me in so many ways through their friendship and through the examples that they set in their lives. So not in any particular order, all three are exalted personalities. The first member of our panel I want to introduce is His Grace Chichani Charan Prabhu. Many of you know him, a little bit of a background. He actually did uh, electronics and telecommunications engineering degree from the Government College of Engineering in Pune. Most of us probably don't that, do not know that. He served as a software engineer for some time and a multinational software corporation. Today, as a devotee of ISKCON, he travels all over the world from Australia to America, and he gives talks at various places, including different universities such as Princeton. You, you might recognize some of these names. Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and Cambridge. And companies such as, again, some of the small ones, Intel, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. So he's, he's, he's gotten around a little bit. He's the author of the world's only Gita daily feature, where he writes a 300-word reflection on a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, and you can find those. Maybe we can put this, Chaitanya Prabhu, while I'm speaking, maybe you can put it in the chat. You can go to www.gitadaily.com. It's a really wonderful inspiration. He's written many, many articles. He's one of my favorite authors for the Back to God magazine. I always get the BTG and flip open to see what has he written on this time. It's the first thing I like to read. And he's been published in a lot of different uh, newspapers uh, in India and other places around the world. His books and his writings have been translated into multiple languages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in his spare time, he wrote 25 books. So that's our first uh, 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 honored guest. Secondly, we have with us a Madhvacharya Prabhu, who lives in, a, uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C., where I am. Took a different route in life, as he describes it. He was born into a tough neighborhood in Baltimore. Those of you that know the city of Baltimore, it's got a few tough neighborhoods within it. And yet he went on, was educated at Johns Hopkins Medical School in Philadelphia, was trained at the George Washington University Hospital in Washington, D.C., which is where he first met his future Diksha Guru, His Holiness Bhakti Tirtamaraj. He heard him on a radio program in 1990. 
Uh, Madhvacharya went on to be an anesthesiologist. Those of you that know anything about medicine, that's the person. If you go, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get surgery, don't just meet your surgeon. You need to meet the anesthesiologist because the surgeon's job is to whatever put in or take out a kidney. The anesthesiologist's job is to keep you alive while the kidney's going in and out. So good person to meet and make sure that they are competent. And he is one such person. After he met His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, uh, he was initiated and then married to his lovely wife, uh, Kunti Devi, in 1991. And since 1995, in addition to his medical practice, um, his home has really been a preaching center and an outreach center, and I think a spiritual oasis for many, many people in Washington, D.C. area. He's one of the few householders I know where I don't really think he's the householder. He's taking care of the house for the people that come there to get spiritual shelter. You come to my house, my apartment, day or night, I promise you the door is going to be locked. And if I don't know you're coming, you're going to find the door remains locked. That's just the nature of my hard heartedness. He is exactly the opposite. His door, his home is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And devotees go and they really take shelter of him and his wife and all the sangha there. So a wonderful person. He's also raised two handsome, intelligent, bright stars in our, our, our youth among the youth uh, in Washington, D.C. So his whole family is wonderfully Christian conscious. So we have two brahmacharis uh, with us on this panel. The next one also uh, originally hails from India, but now is a, a very important leader in, in, in North America. Although he's brahmachari, he's taken up the call to adventure of actually leading and managing a temple in Farmington, Michigan. That's Yugo Kishore Prabhu. Uh, a little bit of background about Yugo. Uh, he also he was trained as a software engineer. Uh, he came to America and had a job uh, working for MetLife in the United States. Many of you know that's a big big insurance company. Um, I spoke with him a little bit the other day to get a little background. I was surprised to learn that he was chanting 16 rounds and following all of our regulated principles before he was initiated with no intention to get initiated. He just did it because it was the right thing to do while he was working outside. At a certain point in time, a, a crisis came in his life and a call to adventure, perhaps, and uh, a little deeper realization about the fragility of life in this material world. And he did a complete flip and just said, OK, met life. Goodbye. Ashram life. Hello. And uh, never turned his back again. He was in New Vrindavan, one of the leading uh, preachers and, and, and caretakers of visitors in New Vrindavan for many years. And then he was called to Farmington, Michigan, where he uh, worked with the community there, developed a wonderful temple that opened just a few years ago. So we have three special speakers with us th this uh, this morning. I want to say it's still morning. Actually, it's early afternoon my time. But I do want to emphasize, particularly out of uh, deep appreciation for Chaitanya Taran Prabhu, he's in India right now, which means those of us that follow the time zones, it's about one o'clock here but 10 and a half hours, it's what, 11.30 at night in, in India. So Chichani Trump, I'm gonna probably direct a few of our questions to you first. And then if, uh, if you fade out, fall out of your chair or have to head off to, uh, to uh, take, care of, uh, take care of your body after nurturing our minds, that, that, that's to be understood. So welcome to all three of you. Thanks for being here with us. And I think we'll go ahead and have all of the, the four of you can unmute yourselves. I'm going to ask a few questions. We've got uh, we've got a little more than, than an hour together. I want to ask some preliminary questions, but I'm hoping we really kind of can get into a conversation here. Um, and I want to start with Chaitanya Charan uh, because I just like the way he thinks. He thinks about things. Every time I have a conversation with Chaitanya Charan, I think, oh, I never thought of it that way. So Chaitanya Prabhu, I want to start out with this question. We're looking at, in this section, the call to adventure within the hero's journey. So what does that mean to you, the call to adventure? What are your thoughts about that in terms of, you know, as a devotee, as a man, as, as a human being? That the, how, how does that, someone who, who made a complete change in your own life to take up spiritual practice in a serious way, what, is it, what are your reflections on the topic, the call to adventure? Thank you, Prabhu, first of all, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share something over here. And I don't deserve your kind words, but I see them as encouragement and instruction for me. Now, regarding the specific topic of 
the call to adventure uh, i think of it in three terms uh since my childhood i when i was one i had polio so i was physically very limited so i never thought of adventures in physical terms much but for me adventures were more in in intellectual terms not in spiritual terms but more in intellectual terms reading understanding explaining so i had a lot of faith in the power of knowledge power of education and i felt that knowledge could empower me and by knowledge by sharing knowledge i could empower others so i always thought of adv- adventure in terms of gaining and sharing knowledge and before i was introduced to krishna consciousness for a brief time i was a part of a social welfare organization where i used to teach kids pre tuition classes on math and history and english and stuff like that and i loved that but i noticed that that people were quite uh, these kids were from economically deprived families most of them had domestic violence the fathers were alcoholics and the fathers were not bad people but they just the kids told me that when they drink they just become like a different person so at that time i felt that how much am i really helping these kids by teaching them these subjects when their homes are so dysfunctional so and i noticed that this was not problem these uh, these parents these fathers who were semi educated or uneducated i could see even in my hostel i was in one of the better colleges in india even in my hostel there were kids who were i could see ruining their careers or at least hurting their careers by by their own self destructive habits so it was different in terms of externals but it struck me at that time the many incidents i don't want to go too much into that but it struck me that education or we can say material education can open doors externally for us but there's something inside us which stops us from walking through the doors which actually blocks us sabotages us from within and that's when i discovered the knowledge of the bhagavad gita i started studying it understanding it trying to live it according to my capacity and i found that same self destructive force within me decreasing i started sharing the gita knowledge with others and i found that they were also helped so for me in that sense if we consider knowledge to be adventure is in terms of doing something exciting doing something empowering doing something uh, transformational then for me the idea was receiving and sharing knowledge was what would be trans- adventurous but what is the knowledge that actually transforms so that is spiritual knowledge so for me in that sense i trying to understand and apply spiritual knowledge and share it with others is what i see as the adventure of my life and of course that leads to many adventures in you know, traveling and meeting different kinds of people i could go into specifics but i find that as long as we have a particular conception of adventure that this is what adventure means it means maybe going up climbing up a mountain or just playing some adventure sports or something like that then we severely limit the possibility of adventure in our own life but if we are open then even uh, if we are open to the idea that adventure may come in our life in many different ways then even an ordinary seeming activity where we are just sitting and speaking with someone sometimes uh, some people come and ask me difficult questions and then when i answer i will be able to give a satisfactory answer and i can see their eyes light with understanding i can say that there are few advent few things as fulfilling as helping people remove the smog that is obstructing them from coming closer to krishna so that's my conception of adventure in bhakti that's beautiful i really like particularly what you say about how if if something's going to be adventure if i heard you right it can't be an adventure that i define the box that's not really an adventure but an adventure means i need to be open to something really new and something that could be very different and outside of of whatever my box is this i i'm i'm willing to stretch myself this far that means i'm really not stretching myself so so thank you that helps mavichar i want to go to you next um the call to adventure I'm, i'm curious what it means to you but particularly i'd like to, if you could describe a little bit how the call to adventure came to you 
you know, in terms of our, you know, your spiritual practice or other aspects of your life. But, you know, particularly when we talked the other day and I got a little insight on on, on your your background is, is uh, like many devotees, it, it has its own unusual twists and turns. So maybe talk about Call to Adventure, your reflections on it, but share a little bit, if you would, your path and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you for your invitation. And it's a real honor to be on this panel with these other uh, amazing, illustrious gentlemen. But uh, in my own case, uh, I was, as I mentioned, born in Baltimore to, uh, and raised in a Baptist church, in a traditional Black Baptist church. And um, when I was a teenager, maybe a junior in high school, 16, 17 years old, my oldest brother, who was a very intelligent man, became a, a, a member of the Nation of Islam, or what we know in America, what we call the Black Muslims. And he was very articulate and um, quite a good debater, and we would have long discussions on religion. And I couldn't defeat him. And that was a really... Um, important moment for me because I was raised in this, you know, traditional conventional family. And for me to leave the Christian church and try something completely different was a big step for me. I can remember praying about it and really asking God to, you know, show me which is the best way for me to go, which what's the best path for me. So I took that, that was the first call, that, that first leap out of, you know, uh, a conventional paradigm to something that was totally different to me. And once I took that leap, then kind of following my, um, my natural spiritual um, inquisitiveness was easier after that first leap. And I, so I became a member of the Nation of Islam. I was a black Muslim. Uh, just a little history. It was led by a gentleman named Elijah Muhammad, who left the planet in 1975. After that, the nation kind of dissolved into a lot of confusion. And then I became interested in uh, traditional African religions. And, and then that kind of morphed into more of a black liberation theology in America. I took on an uh, African name, Sundiata, who was one of the great uh, kings of Mali in West Africa. And then from there, I was uh, introduced to Taoism and I studied Taoism for some time. And from there, I um, was introduced to uh, yoga, Kundalini yoga. There was a gentleman by the name of Muktananda, I believe, from India. And then um, he was succeeded by a young woman, Guru Mai. She was very popular. They had an ashram in California and in New York. So I was doing Kundalini yoga and going through my medical education. I was a, actually a fellow in critical, critical care medicine at George Washington University. And then I happened to hear the, you know, the voice of my future guru, who was Bhakti Chirta Swami on a radio program being interviewed. And, um, it, it, you know, it's not that he said anything um, earth shattering, but he was just so logical, practical and insightful in his presentation. And I, it really sparked my curiosity. And um, I went to see uh, the devotees at a meeting at Howard University the next week and, and uh, at each step, the presentation was just, you know, very um, convincing. It, it made complete sense, and it it um, it was in sync with something within my heart. You know, it made sense. It, it connected, and uh, it was easy for me to just um, kind of follow step by step from there. It's interesting I'm, as, as you're describing it. I'm hearing that, <clears throat> you know, starting with your brother <clears throat> who challenged you. You know, here's the adventure. And you said, OK, you know, he defeated me. Let me let me do it. I don't know where it's going to end. I, I don't I don't see that. You know, it's like call the adventure. Part of it is like that leap of faith that Kierkegaard talks about. So you, you, you stepped in and then he led you to the you know, the next adventure came and then the next adventure came. and The next adventure came. And, and in each one of those, you were willing to open that door. I don't know if we'll have time to get into it at this point, but I'd be very curious to find out later because you're a married uh, man. At one point, at what point uh, uh, Kunti Devi uh, came, did, you know, did she get connected to you when you were the black Muslim or, 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 or the Baptist? Or, you know, and how was that for her? But we'll, we'll, tweet, we'll take that up maybe when we have the uh, a, 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 a Grahasta Ashram conference and not, not the men's ashram. But thanks for sharing that. Yoga Prabhu, I'm really curious because... Um, as I understand it, I mentioned a little bit, you know, here you are, this, this, this young man, as this, you know, bright eyed, 
came from India, very diligent, working as a, you know, in software for a big corporation, you know, making lots of money, you know, maintaining a nice, you know, pretty puck of lifestyle and feeling pretty comfortable. What happened that now you're, you know, there you are with your your, your beautiful tea lock and your shaved head and you're in Farmington living in, 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 a, in a small room someplace, I'm sure. What was that call to adventure for you? And and and, and what did how did you respond to that? Thank you very much for inviting me for this wonderful program. My obeisance to everyone and very grateful to be with you all. And it's a privilege actually. Um, I'm, a, I'm an Indian, quote unquote South Indian. Uh, maybe I liked watching adventurous movies, but when it comes to life, <laughs> I'm a play safe guy actually, you know. Um, I'm definitely scared of adventures. Um, so, but maybe at the later part of my life, definitely giving knowledge to others and waking them up from ignorance. Maybe that's what I considered an adventure. But uh, yes, I came to America. I used to work in Singapore. Um, then I came to America. I got a job in my life. One day, uh, I was already, I was introduced to Krishna consciousness in Singapore, you know. Um, then one day, I mean, that from there I got a job in America. I was working in 2001, if I remember correctly. Uh, I was a practicing devotee. When I opened the newspaper, uh, New York Times, and read, Ronald Reagan fell in the bathroom and broke his hip. And uh, Nancy Reagan, the former first lady, was requesting all the Americans to pray for him. So, wow, when I read this, I thought, <clears throat> Actually, I told myself these things. If I go to hospital and tell him, sir, you were a Hollywood star for a few decades, means you had good money, name and fame, and best sense enjoyment. That's what people are looking for in this world, which you enjoyed for a few decades. One thing was missing from your resume. What is that? Power. That's what people want. Once you get these three things, that you are not getting. But you got that later also. You were two times California governor and later two times American president. Wow. You know, so honestly speaking, nobody can have this type of resume, you know, uh, in their lives actually. So I thought, sir, so you have all these things. So think of those good olden days and remember your today's suffering. No, body is a machine as per Gita and uh, hip gives a good support to the body. When that is broken, naturally you go through excruciating pain. So I thought, if I tell him these things, what would, what would he possibly say to me? Definitely would say, fool number one, how much I enjoyed yesterday, it will not compensate today's suffering. That came to my mind. Mm. Wow. Yesterday's happiness will not compensate today's suffering. The power, position, sense enjoyment, money, how much you enjoyed yesterday, years, yesterday, decades, when you go through the suffering today, it will not compensate. When that realization dawned on me, then I told myself, look, you came to America to make money. Gita, which I read before, which I already read, convinced me and told me, you're not the body but a spirit soul. It means because he was born in early 19th century, is in his old age body is giving trouble, this machine. So maybe 30, 40 years later, I will also go through the same thing. That time, whatever money I have in the bank, the name and fame and position I, know I would have will not compensate my suffering. You know, birth, old age, disease and death. You know, everyone has to go through. But Krishna says, Pasyati, apasyati. People see but don't see. Wow. So that day, when my body goes through the trouble, all these things will not help me. Means I have to do something else. Then um, I told my brother, um, as I said, I was, I was already chanting 16 rounds. I want to try how this life is about, you know. I want to realize myself before my body breaks down. So I told my, I told my brother, take good care of the mom. I transferred all the money to India. Uh, and I told my brother, take some money, of course, I gave to Nirindavan, but let me tell you, I have a little fear. I cannot imagine my life 
not having any money. By this time, we were so so used to using credit cards, you know. So I know you Welcome do not have. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to, you know, put on my, I'm going to join full time next 30 years, not having credit card, no money, but then maybe I'll be abused. I had little fear. So I told myself I'll try maybe a month, then I'll make this decision. So I was hesitant. Then I went to Nurunavan. I now stayed two weeks. Then I realized it's late. I should have come long. I should have come long ago. And we're better late than never. Mm. Uh, then I joined full time. Mm. By your mercy, I you. never looked back. Thank you, Prabhu. It's interesting. To, uh, thinking about Radhika Raman's uh, discussion earlier today, I wonder, you know, to what extent mentors sometimes uh, aren't necessarily giving us uh, happy instructions. It's almost like Ronald Reagan was one of your mentors in that mm-hmm. sense from his wisdom of suffering. Chichen, uh, back to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, I'm curious. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, the call to adventure. And then I think as this kind of devotees, we talk a lot about our mission. So responding to that venture, at least when we reach that point, which all of you have certainly, of, of, of really taking up the adventure of, you know, the call of Krishna, the call of Prabhupada, the call of the Acharyas, the call of the Guru. Um, and and each of you, as we were thinking about putting this, this panel together, I was thinking that these are three people that really married the mission, if we can use that term. You know, two of them are brahmacharis and they're married to the mission. And with all due respect to Mahavachari's wife, who I mentioned before, wonderful Vaishnavi, Akunti, he's also married to the mission. So Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, reflect a little bit about this. Um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges maybe that you face? Because part of the reason we want to look at this, it, it's not just an intellectual exercise for all of us, you know, not minimizing the points you've made about the importance of all three of you analyzing intellectually. But, you know, the honest truth is every one of us listening to this uh, presentation, we, you know, we're, we're conditioned souls. We're human beings. We have our limitations. We have our doubts. As, as Yuga was saying, we have our fears. We have our limitations. But we've responded. We're trying to respond to this call to adventure. And there's challenges that come. So part of the reason we want to talk about this is to give each other strength. You know, maybe I rose up to yesterday's adventure, but I don't know if I'm ready for tomorrow's. But through this association, I think, wow, Krishna worked in his life and his life and his life and increases my own realization of faith. So you've really, Chaitanya Trumpu, you know, you you, you mentioned you, 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 you had polio, it's, you got some physical challenges, and yet you're flying all around the world. You know, and and, and you're and you're you're up at eleven o'clock at night, you know, to talk, talking to us in all corners of the world. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've faced in responding to this call to the venture that you, that you could share with us that might give us some insights on how we can uh, face and overcome the challenges we might face when responding to the call to adventure? Okay. Mm-hmm. I I would say that there are three different kinds of challenges. One is the challenges in our service, challenges in our sangha, and challenges in our sadhana. There could be many different, but these are the broad three categories. Whenever we try to do any service, we may try to preach, we may try to build a temple, we may try to uh, arrange for some programs, classes, whatever. The challenges related with service. Then Sangha is not just association. One of the key things which I feel can make bhakti, or at least it happened for me over, over a decade gradually, is that uh, bhakti becomes adventurous, or you could say joyful and adventurous, when we have association that is like-minded and nourishing. So in one sense, if we consider these three things, service, sangha, and sadhana, the sadhana in one sense is always going to be a struggle. In, uh, it, it, it takes effort to say to do our rounds attentively, to, to deal with our own the fickleness and unsteadiness of our mind. And that is going to be a conceivable struggle. It's going to be a struggle. I have more or less reconciled myself that it's going to be a lifelong struggle. Certainly, there is some taste coming gradually, but I don't see this being exciting and adventurous in the immediate future for me. There are moments of adventure. 
And even if you look at service, service also is awesome. There are, there are moments of some wonderful success, wonderful experiences, but overall services also have their challenges. And it's fortunate if we are engaged in a service which is according to our swabhava. But one of the things which helped me to really make bhakti joyful and adventurous was association. So finding like-minded association. Uh, what do I mean by, now that we often use the word like-minded association, but I would like to make this a little bit more specific. Like-minded, what does it mean? That means two things. That in a, We all ultimately have the goal of going back to Godhead or developing love for Krishna, which is wonderful. But these are very, you could say, long-term or lofty goals. We also want to do something in the world. We all appreciate Krishna consciousness in particular ways. So I feel that if we can find devotees who share our definitions of success in bhakti, so, for example, if somebody likes to study Shastra and analyze scripture and analyze things from a contemporary perspective analyze, and present things, somebody likes to build temples, somebody likes to, whatever it is that we like to do, it's so important to get association which is like-minded. And without that association, uh, we always are, we tend to get caught, at least I found myself getting caught too much in my own internal battles. That so, if we can get like-minded association, mm. then bhakti becomes very stimulating. Bhakti becomes very relishable, and that means not just that we are discussing Krishna katha and elevated aspects about Krishna. That's wonderful if we can, but even with respect to our services, if we are discussing our concerns, if we are discussing our aspirations, our setback, and if there is somebody with whom who understands what we are going through, what challenges we are facing. I feel that that it not only relieves a burden, it is something which we have to look forward to during the normal course of our life. Mm -hmm. So I find that is, uh, otherwise there can be loneliness, there can be frustration, there can be guilt, there can be insecurity. And all these in one sense are parts of an adventure. If somebody, mm -hmm. just one of my close friends he he went on a adventure trek uh, to a he, he went basically mountain climbing in the himalayas and he was telling me some of the challenges that he faced over there and apart from the physical challenge aspects i was thinking that what he was going through there was fear there was insecurity there was exhaustion and they were they were, they were together but they were lonely because each other was trying to climb up so i thought that something in our spiritual life is also similar so he told me that what survived, what helped me survive was that, you know, I had two people with whom I became very close friends and that helped me. So I feel that the adventure aspect comes largely to Sangha because that's where we connect. And the Bhagavatam 11th Kant also says that, that the highest joy that is in Bhakti is in relishing Krishna in the association of devotees. So this is not just, again, I said, not just relishing exalted transcendental aspects of Krishna, but exalting our challenges, our successes, our concerns in our attempts to serve Krishna. So that's one thought of Beautiful. mine. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, but that was really wonderful. I'll, I'll admit to everybody uh, that who's listening in, we're having some preliminary conversations with each of our three panelists. And I was thinking this is, I'm destined to feel halfway through, we should have just had one person here. Because all, all three of you, we, you know, we could spend a lot of time hearing from each of you alone. But uh, but we we want to move around and, and get a little bit of a little bit of benefit from hearing from each of you. So Mahavichari, same question. Um, you know, you've married the mission in, in in a different way. You're 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 a professional person. You're a medical doctor. You've got all the pressures that are there. I mean, I've you know people. You do things that uh, help save people's lives and. You do, and, and and you try to do things to help save people's lives, and sometimes they they don't get saved. You see, you see death and and life, and the the challenges and the precipice of that every day professionally. And still, you come home, and and you, as I mentioned, your your homes there as a shelter for others. What are some of the challenges that that you think you faced within this concept of the call to adventure? What are some of the challenges, and maybe particularly, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that you would share? 
Um, can I tell you a quick story? I'll try to make it brief. So I, 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 um, when I first started associating with the Bodhis, there, there was a preaching center in uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, we would, everyone would go and gather there. I was a young doctor. I, my wife had had one child and she was pregnant with a second, our second son. And, uh, you know, like young doctors do, we built a 6,000 square foot house just a little bit outside of Annapolis. When the house was complete, I took my guru. I just wanted to show him the house and he seemed completely disinterested during the visit. And at any rate, so I showed him, you know, said, you know, this is what we're doing. And of course, we're offering everything to you. And so he said, OK, that's nice. Uh, take me back. And so I did. And they were having a dispute with the landlord. And um, so I went to class one day and Guru made an announcement. He says, OK, I just want to tell you that in three weeks, we're moving into Madhavacharya's house. He made this announcement in class. I'm sitting in the front row. And, you know, this was the first time I had heard of it. So I had to go home and tell my wife, who, you know, young wife, pregnant, just moved into a big new house, that this is what was announced. And um, that's what happened. And we just um, uh, making the decision to accept that and just flow with it was like one of the best decisions of my life because it gave me the association of all of these Vaishnavs all the time. And uh, that association is what, as Chaitanya Charan was just speaking about, that association is what really helped to strengthen me, to, you know, fortify me. And what it helped me to do was um, kind of in terms of integrate my work into my, uh, into my devotional service in the sense that what I was doing at work in terms of serving patients, I could see them more because of this association as, as uh, people who were beloved by Krishna, who were cherished by Krishna. And it was my responsibility to, to try to care for them in a way that would be pleasing to Krishna because he loved them. And so it helped me to integrate my work into my devotional service so that there wasn't any distinction or um, conf conflict. And then, so we were at this house for um, some years, I think four or five years, and then Guru made another announcement. So, okay, I want you to move from this house, give this house up, and we're gonna to move to a smaller place. And so, I, you know, this is a nice place, you know, <laughs> as I said, it's a really big house. and you know, close to Annapolis and this and that. But my wife and I discussed it and she said to me, she said, you know, if we if we don't move from this house and everyone moves and we stay here, this just becomes a very attractive coffin. Mm -hmm. And um, that was completely correct because um, just by staying under the shelter and association of devotees, as Prabhu was just saying, it that that is life. That does promote growth. Growth is life. Growth and change means you're alive and it brings its own sense. It's inherently, it brings adventure and, um, and makes things interesting and promotes growth. And uh, that's, that's, what, that's what we want to do, grow and become more and more of a surrendered servant to, you know, these amazing personalities, Srila Prabhupada, our gurus and the great Vaishnavas around us. I like especially what you said at the end <clears throat> that growth and change means you are alive. Yeah. Sometimes change, you know, especially the, those of us getting older, maybe sometimes younger people too, but you know, change in itself becomes a bit of a threat. We like they talk about we get in our comfort zone. So remembering that the fact that if there's change and if there's challenges, that means I'm alive. That's really great. You go people I'm thinking um you know, one of the things you did not too long ago, you were there in New Vrindavan and you were, you know, under the shelter of the temple structure and so many things. And you kind of, you know, took off into the wilderness of Western Michigan to, uh, you know, to develop a community there to take on the responsibilities of, 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 of a temple, new temple. That certainly was really responding to a call to adventure. What what are some of the challenges that you you faced in doing that? And I, and I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, this why part of the reason I like this mix. You know, we've got... A brahmanjari who's supposed to live simply in the house of the guru, who's traveling all around the world and doing all this wonderful preaching. We've got another person who's married, 
who who's you know the 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 the, the prototype you know like he's, he's got his big six thousand square foot house he lives comfortably in and makes elaborate deities and and you know that's it you know he's a householder and then we got a brahmin chai who's again supposed to be living simply and he throws himself into managing a temple you know in a country he's not born in and you know these are people that really have married the mission and respond to that call to adventures in really unique and I think um, exemplary ways. So you go tell us a little bit about, about, you know, what are some of the challenges you've faced? I, I think it, particularly at this transition and as a devotee, you told us your earlier story, now moving into taking, it must have been a little, as you said, scary. And, you know, what are some of the lessons and, and, and the things that you learned from that call to adventure? Um, I mean, I agree definitely with what Chaitanya Chandra said. I mean, with regard to these challenges, I consider first one internal challenges and the challenges with the people you live and plus the challenges in the service, you know? So internal challenges means it's mind. Everyone agrees, so difficult to control. And um, um, external challenges means, especially the people with whom you live, you coexist. Um, and the ch- challenges in service. So I think, uh, good morning program, good sadhana uh, is a solution to address the internal challenge, you know, especially deal with uh, this uh, uh, crazy troublesome mind, you know. Um, when it comes to the second one, external challenge, especially um, the place you are living, we need to develop uh, nice relationships with the people, you know. Uh, Bhakti the Swami famous statement is there, you know, these are the people I live with. These are the same people I leave my body, you know, in their presence one day. So, I mean, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, in Kali, this Kali Yuga, quarrel and hypocrisy. Alone, we are hypocritical, together we are quarrelsome. So, so if we can um, address the internal challenges very well and uh, uh, balance our mind definitely that will help us to deal with the devotees with whom we are living with nicely then they become they will not become challenge but they'll become your strength with these two things when you go to the field of activity seva you know seva when you seva means your sir is preaching uh, what are the you know external world uh, when you build up inner strength by sadhana and by developing good relationships with the devotees with whom you are living with, uh, you'll be able to you'll be able to address the challenges that you face in the field of your activity that is preaching. You know, uh, and actually in the preaching, what happens is you give, give, give. So when you give, you need to feel it's like a pot. Preacher is like a pot. As long as you are giving, you need to refill yourself. Otherwise, one day you'll be totally empty and exhausted. Um, so for that reason, uh, I st- definitely my man in my life, I bank on uh, morning sadhana, chanting the holy name, and uh, plus you know depending on the uh, on the devotees with whom I'm living with and uh, developing good relationships, good relationships, even though they may be very young, you know finding good qualities in them and derive strength from them, then uh, with this. A strength from external, I mean, external in the temple, internally from sadhana, and go to the um, go to your preaching field. And the last point is, I sh- we need to count on the uh, blessings of the guru and the senior devotees. That is very important. That's what I felt. You know, uh, when we definitely do what we are asked to do, and especially when we when we jump into the free of preaching for the pleasure of Prabhupada and senior and Vaishnavas. We, we receive unlimited blessings with, by which we, we, have, we step up. I mean, we get inner strength. Uh, with that, we'll go forward, actually. That is my experience. Thank you, Prabhu. Chaitanya Charan, I'm, I'm noting that it's, uh, I think it's midnight there exactly right now, and somehow you're still with us. So we're all very grateful for that. I want to go back to something you, you, said, you said earlier. If I got it right, you mentioned, and I, I really appreciated this comment, that we we all have these lofty goals, you know, become a pure devotee, go back to Godhead, awaken our love for Krishna. And we know sometimes, uh, you know, new devotees that we used to talk about something called the pure devotee syndrome. 
you know, PDS. And that's that, that's that's all we're supposed to be is, is we just we just think 24 hours a, a day about love of God. But, you know, we, we all know that, you know, that's 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 for exalted, very, very exalted personalities. That's not where we are. We are multifaceted people. So then you mentioned that that we also need to find devotees who share in our, our inspiration. And I think I've got it right. You said our definition of success or you said, or we can get caught up in our, our personal battles. Explain a little more what, what you meant by that. If Hopefully I captured the, what you said earlier. We get caught up in our personal battles if we don't, if we don't have that, uh, you know, people that share in, let's say, more, more day-to-day kind of goals and, 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 and aspirations that we have. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu, for that question. And yes, this discussion is so stimulating that I am happy to be here for as long as possible. So two things with respect to this, that uh, in one sense, we talk a lot about the long-term success and say in terms of uh, of de- developing pure love for Krishna. But along the way, how are we going to move forward? So what are the things that give us strength in bhakti? So one of the one of the biggest challenges that I have found in, in our movement, and I'm also guilty of this, it's not that, I don't think it's our movement, it's just in general human psychology, that if something works for me, say for example, for me, memorizing verses, gives me a lot of strength. And I had quite a humorous as well as a, a significant realization of this. I, whenever I take Darshan of the Deity, at least a few years ago, before I became intellectually lazy, I used to memorize verses. And whenever I pray to the deities, I would memorize a verse and offer a prayer in connection with that verse. And I would really relish that. I would be absorbed in the Darshan of the Deities. And I spoke that in a few classes. And after that, one devotee came and told me that, you know, for me, darshan has become a matter of great anxiety and tension now. And you are responsible for it. He was saying in a funny, half funny, half serious way. What happened? He said, I would just hear Govinda Madhi Purusham, look at the beautiful deities and feel filled with so much ecstasy. But you said we should memorize verses. Now I try to memorize verse and I forget the verse. And when I'm taking darshan of the deities, I mean, so much anxiety. Will I remember the verse? Which line I've forgotten? And says all the rasa has gone from the from the darshan for me now. So what struck me at that time is it is simple, but just because that gave me strength, that gave me absorption, that gave me taste, doesn't mean that it is going to give us absorption or taste. So the shloka memorization while taking darshan is one specific activity, but we all have this. So right now, Karthik is going on. And sometimes I've, there's one devotee recently who wrote to me saying that, you know, I feel so much pressure to intensify my bhakti in 15 different ways from 15 different devotees. Some devotees say you should fast more. Some devotees say you should chant more around. Some devotees say you should read Bhagavatam more. Some devotees say you should travel to a dham no matter how risky it is. Some devotees say you should go for a morning program and you should. So these are mostly householder devotees that are asking me questions. So he says, I feel that Karthik, instead of being a uh, being a month where I'm remembering Krishna more, I'm in constant fear how many devotees I'm displeasing because I'm not able to do what they're telling me to do. So, <laughs> so what's so the what, lesson? What's, what's, what's the lesson from that that you draw? My understanding is that I have to find out what gives me strength and associate with devotees who also get strength in that. So if I love memorizing verses, then I have to find some devotees who also relish that and discuss it with them, relish it with them. Otherwise, if my strength comes in memorizing verses and somebody else's strength comes in chanting 64 rounds, and then that person will think, what are you doing? You're just being a jnani memorizing verses. So even within bhakti, we have to actually, in one sense, find out what gives us strength and then find out those who also gain strength from a similar activity. And then we can have that meeting of minds where we actually feel nourished. Otherwise, it, it's a, so the challenge is that 
if I gain strength by something, I tend to presume that everybody else will gain strength by that thing. And I'm surrounded by people who are in that sense different from me. Then when I am with them, rather than feeling secure, there's one devotee who told me this, it was very humorously, but so insightful to he says, there are some devotees, when you come in their presence, it is like you have to justify your existence in Krishna consciousness to them. <laughs> so I think that really takes away the whole adventure aspect from Krishna Bhakti and makes us, so I would say the opposite, the biggest enemy of adventure is the feeling of guilt. If I'm constantly feeling guilty, oh, I didn't do this and I don't do that and don't do that, then there is no possibility for adventure. So, and I feel that you know that, that goes that goes back to what Radhika Raman was speaking earlier. He talked about that the that the service of the mentor, the one of the two primary functions is to help them become humble, which may be the guilt when it's not used properly, then becomes guilt. But but confidence that one to be given confidence that I I can do this, I can achieve this, that the way I do express myself in Krishna consciousness is is pleasing to Krishna. And that I should focus on that and not 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 measure myself against others. I think that's a very important point. Yeah, I, that's beautifully put. Humility and confidence. The way I put it is that that at different times we need different things in our devotional life. If I am feeling inflated, I'm feeling proud, then I need to look ahead to see how much distance I have to go. But if I'm feeling disheartened, mm -hmm. then I need to look back and see how far I have come. So we all in our devotional journey have come a significant distance. So but if I'm feeling discouraged and I'm told to look ahead, see how far you have to go, then that is only going to multiply my discouragement. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the balance, I think. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, just to mention everybody, we're going to go about another 20 minutes. I, I've got uh, one more question. That, that was my, my last question for Chaitanya Chiran this, this time around. Probably. I want to ask, uh, go, go to Madhva and you go one more time and then we'll, we'll see if there's some questions from, 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 the, from the Sangha. Um, Madhva, you know, we talked about some of the challenges that we face and you gave some wonderful stories about your experience. That, you know, the guru tells you, sell the house, sell the house, move here, move there, open the door and, and all of that and responding to that. Um, you know, you're a father of two young men. You also interact with a lot of young devotees, and and we we're hearing a little bit about the, these challenges, the importance of, of you know service, sangha, sadhana, association gives us strength. But sometimes, you know, the fact is, I mean, I think, I think we've all been in a position in in our lives where, you know, it's it's as Yoga said, it's scary. I mean, I can remember when I first became a devotee, I was kind of like the you know the sloth that slowly, slowly, slow, painfully withdrew myself from you know my materialistic life and. Finally got enough guts to, you know, stick my thumb out and hitchhike across the country and eventually move in a temple and all of that. We all have our own stories like that. What advice do you give to your fellow men, especially young men, looking out at, at, at across that, that abyss? Or last night, a yoga shrapa who talked about the precipice. You remember there, there was an image, those of us that saw that. There's a man on the top of the cliff looking over. You know, it's scary sometimes. So what advice do you give to other men? You know, and not that you're a superhero, but you're, you know, you're, you're a person who's wrestled with these challenges yourself. You learn some things and we're here to learn from each other. Uh, we're, we're a team here. We're learning from each other as, as friends and as peers. What advice would you get from what you've learned about responding to that call to adventure? Um, thank you for the question. <laughs> and you will, I'm coming to you next. So you get a minute to figure out what you're going to say. So same question is going to come to you. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, meeting people who are, have had some interest in, who have taken some interest in Krishna consciousness and are looking down this path of bhakti and um, seeing that it presents challenges and difficulties. Um, the first thing I try to think of is, is just try to present a, if I can present a good example in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, trying to trying to relay that it's possible to traverse this path, 
and and try to stay balanced and that ultimately if you can traverse if you put forth this effort that the rewards are great and the rewards are just this that by you know by tra- traversing the path of bhakti and developing love for god that you become an, an agent of positive change in your environment you become a carrier or a um via medium of positive change you become a better husband you become a better student you become a better brother or son or you know whatever role that you're playing whatever whatever your dharma is that you fulfill it in a much more meaningful and and, and powerful way and in doing that it brings you ultimately happiness and fulfillment and and that and that you know of course ultimately there's no other way to experience this other than um connecting with that that real essence that that loving potential that is our birthright that we all inherently have and so i you know i try to we try to present a nice community where there are a lot of balanced people and and families and grahastas and brahmacharis and try to present good relationships that would that would um give some fortification and shelter and then just present the goal as being worthwhile and that at each step of the way there are rewards it's just not you know you know at the end you know you'll be back in the spiritual world but at each step of the way you'll be more equipped to handle stress at each step of the way you'll be more equipped to negotiate conflict at each step of the way you can find some some uh, increased happiness in in terms of your relationships and in terms of service to others and this awakens more and more love it reinforces that and it's you know you are rewarded at each step of the way so it's just not you know what you get at the end it's it's a con- it can be a a um, gradual uh you know rewarding system where you're you're feeling these benefits of of prosecuting this path of bhakti That's beautiful. Thank you. I, I, it really struck me. You said to, to be an agent of positive change, and I think the advice I'm hearing is is appreciate that you're becoming an agent. And of course, there's ups and downs along the way. You know, sometimes we all we may be an agent of positive change. Some days, some weeks, some months, some years, we may not be such a positive addition. But that we see, you know, we're we're working our way up. I think that's a really uh, that's empowering and inspiring. Yuga, let me go to, to you for just just a, a minute or two. Just just your thoughts on that question. Then we're going to open up to the to the to the group for the next last fifteen or twenty minutes. What what your thoughts on that advice? Advice. You talked about the importance of of sudden how yourself you take shelter of, of, of chanting and your morning program. In addition to the sudden effect, just because you know you're a guy that had a job on the outside, you deal with people that work in the outside world. You deal with brahmacharis. You know everybody in every every shape, way, and form uh, is in your community. What general advice do you give people facing this this call to adventure? I always ask people, do you have a bank account? Usually they respond yes. So 50 years later, that bank account, that money will be there, but you won't be there. Yes, yes. So um, life is a triangle. It's going back to God, it is important. But... um, so if I say life like this, triangle. Bhagavad Gita will not pay mortgage to your home. So you need to work eight hours. Mother Jira Prabhu made a nice point balance. You know, that's what I, I throw, throughout my life I've been preaching. So eight hours you work, you know, to maintain your, you know, uh, material life. But triangle means eight, 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 three is 24. And uh, another some hours, social life. If you keep on working, making money, family members will be frustrated. They'll fry, they'll be fried. So hang on with family members, relatives, friends, whatever, social life. Today, we have, everyone has good middle life. Everyone has good social life. But a third line is missing. Because of that, uh, people have actually, you know, mental problems. Why the third line is missing? Spiritual life. So, yes, we have a body to maintain. Uh, we need to socialize so that we can calm our mind. But uh, spiritual, is, spiritual life is also of paramount importance. So when you, uh, out of eight hours, for newcomers, I said 10 minutes to begin with, for serious devotees, 
Um, get up in the morning, bathe your consciousness with the chanting of the holy name. Uh, then with that uh, consciousness, you can do the rest of the activities in a very nice way, in a mature way. That is what Bhakti Yoga is all about. So if you, you know, uh, if you balance your life with this triangle, material life, social life, and of course, spiritual life, spiritual life does support. And you are showing like this. Then I remembered this. How does spiritual life contribute to the social, uh, social and material life? Very easy. Um, if you are driving on this road behind, the road is like this. So you cannot tell I'm president of America, prime minister of India. My left should always go at a 30 degree acute angle. Problems will come. Uh, problems do, will come. Then uh, how does spiritual life help? Maturity, patience, wait, wait, wait. Today, you know, no patience. But if you have a genuine spiritual life, it will give you so much patience and confidence with which you address your day-to-day -day problems. That is how you balance uh, your social life and mental life and spiritual life. That's what I say. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, yeah, the emphasis on balance, and, and, and I'm hearing also the idea that um, we don't necessarily have to think we're supposed to, you know, transform our lives overnight. Calling, responding to the call to adventure doesn't mean you, you know, you don't pay the mortgage. It doesn't mean that you you give up all everything else that you've learned about taking care of yourself, your friends, your family, everything else. But it's, it's pursuing that next step. And, and not necessarily, you know, naively abandoning everything else. I want to go to the to, to the Sangha now. We talked about Sangha and the importance of it. And before we go to Hari Murti Prabhu, I'll just mention to everybody, I was at a, a seminar one time, if I can remember how they did it. The, the, the coordinator, the, the facilitator said, yes, please, uh, please uh, is, uh, ask your questions. And please avoid a, a carefully crafted lecture in the form of a question. You know, sometimes people do that, right? So, so we, we want to try to take advantage of the expertise of our, of our and the insights of our, our three our three panelists. So, Hari Prabhu, you're on. Your question, please. Yeah, and Hare you're Krishna. muted, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're very clear. Yeah, please accept my humble obeisance. This is all glories to Srila Prabhupada. My name is Hari Pad Das. I'm a disciple of His Holiness Bhakti Marga Swami. Uh, my question is to Madhavacharya. Prabhu, I am uh, have a friend who's Afro gentleman, and uh, I I'm taking him to our sangha. We don't have a temple here, but we have a meeting place in Cleveland, Ohio. So, home of Bhakti Tirtha Swami, your Guru Maharaj, and my you know I love Bhakti Tirtha Swami. So, my question to you is, what book should I give him? I have given him um, the book called uh, 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 Book of Eights by Her Grace Mother Krishna Nandini Devi Dasi. Um, I, I've run out of ABCs of chanting the holy names of God. Um, this is, he's, he's, he's totally new, he, this uh, gentleman. So what book should I give him? He's completely new to Krishna conscious. I don't even know if he's vegetarian, but I just take him, I pick him up at a spot and I take him and he's very interested. He's, he's tried to learn Sanskrit before. That's my question. Thank you, Haribo. Okay. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes. We okay. can. It's very so um, the books I would recommend, first of all, your association is what's really essential. It's uh, someone used the term bhakti shakti. You know, it's the, the shakti the, of your bhakti that really touches someone's heart. But then to give some philosophical foundation to, you know, this transformation, I mean, um, uh, uh, my uh, uh, His Holiness uh, Dr. Fritha Swami wrote a book called Spiritual Warrior Two. That's been, um, I think, it's a good introduction in a way that perhaps this this gentleman could appreciate. Um, the, the other book that um, we use here, this is, I mean, many many books would do. I'm just telling you my own personal experience. Other books are also beautiful and wonderful and effective. But in our, my personal experience, the other book we use are, is The Journey Home as a nice introductory book. And um, But once again, just your kindness, your patience, your interest and enthusiasm are what really makes such a big difference. 
I'm wondering if, um, Thank you. While, while we're waiting for, uh, for any other questions to come forward, do the three of you have anything you'd like to ask each other or maybe reflect on some of what you, you've heard from your, your, your different panelists? So what Malvacha just mentioned about the personal association being the most important, I find that uh, that is something which, uh, especially when we are having new people coming in, uh, that is probably the single most important element. We can give them books, we can create a nice temple atmosphere, we talk a lot about, especially in Western outreach culture and other things. And it's interesting that when we talk about Western outreach, in India also, it's becoming that, especially in some parts of Mumbai, that uh, there are many young people who will not come to a traditional temple at all. But they're interested in spirituality and they need some specific setups for that. But the most important thing is that personal relationship. So I just wanted to reflect on that, that it's it's something which we need uh, throughout our spiritual life, right? right from the early stages to be introduced in our bhakti and then throughout. But one and then as we grow, of course, one thing may happen is that who we can relate with closely may change over the years. It's not necessarily the same devotees who introduced us in the early years will necessarily be our be the closest to us or will be our will be the best guides for us throughout our spiritual life. So Krishna can guide us through different devotees at different times. And Krishna can not just guide, but can also offer us friendship, affection, acceptance, whatever we need. I just wanted to reflect on that point. Thank you. You're asking him to reflect or that was your reflection? So that was my reflection on that point. But, well, that, that's, that's but, you, no, if you, you wanted him to comment on that? No, but the point of you know the different devotees being uh, that we may not always get all the guidance necessary from one devotee throughout our spiritual life. And that's why the idea of along with Diksha Guru, we have Shiksha Gurus and we have multiple Shiksha Gurus. That's also something which is important. Maybe any of you would like to comment on that? You know, Radhika Raman actually spoke about that extensively. And Chaitanya Chan, I'm beginning, now that I, I made a point of asking for questions, and then we're getting a flood of questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to some that were in the chat box if I may. This is general question. Any one of you can jump in on, and respond to this. On the hero's journey, when there are roadblocks, I've noticed myself focusing on the issues, feeling guilty about them, and not having enthusiasm to follow the adventure instead. So getting tripped up by the by the roadblocks and losing enthusiasm. Any suggestions from your experience how to stand up instead of falling down in those moments? That's a question from Naima Sharanya Prabhu. So anybody want to grab that one? Yeah. Chaitanya so, Charan, you you go forward because I've got I've got a special one for Madhvachari next. So what are your reflections on that? How do you stand up in those minutes where the roadblocks come and and that guilt is there. Or yoga. Yoga, you want to in on that? Either one of you. No, Chaitanya Chandra, please go ahead. Okay. So I generally talk about three things. First is that if we consider like our consciousness versus time as a graph, so there are times when we have struggles, the urges that we have, they become too strong. And the urges we have, they have surges. And those surges make it unbearable, irresistible. So my understanding would be don't define once your own spiritual life based on solely on what happens when the urges surge. Sometimes it just becomes irresistible. But after the surge goes down, what do we do in between that time? Say, if at that time I'm simply beating myself up, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Then next time when I'm going to have that surge again, I'm, I'm going to be unprepared, I'm going to be weakened, and I'm going to fall again. But instead, focus on what happens in between. Maybe during that time, okay, this happened. That doesn't necessarily mean that Krishna has rejected me. Krishna still is in my, the Paramatma is still there in my heart. And in one sense, that Apichet Sudurachara verse is there. There are many verses in the Bhagavad Gita. Basically, there is nothing that we can ever do 
that can make Krishna abandon us. We, we as finite souls don't have the power to do anything that will make the infinite stop loving us. So in that sense, we can have that assurance and then focus on trying to connect with Krishna and strengthen ourselves. So if we do that, then over a period of time, even when the urges have that, those surges, we'll be able to resist. But if we define ourselves solely in terms of how, how we deal with those surges, mm -hmm. then sometimes we all have certain conditionings which may take a lot of time to get, to get over. So what do we do at that time? It, will, it requires courage to accept our weaknesses, maybe to confess to someone or to acknowledge to others, to a trustworthy guide. But it also requires another kind of our courage to accept ourselves with our weaknesses. That, okay, this is how I am, but still, even now, it's not that Krishna is going to reject me. And then, once we once we are focused on, the, okay, this, I don't know what's going to happen after my, my the urge surges after 48 hours or after one week, after two weeks, I don't know. But in the intermediate, let me do what I can to strengthen myself. Try to practice bhakti more, try to make my life more sattvic, try to cultivate whatever healthy habits I have. Let's focus on the space in between. That's the single most important thing that I say. And then second is that it's, it's impossible to fight, uh, fight our unhealthy habits by no resolutions. And no, I won't do this. We need, we need more of a yes kind of resolution. Like if it's a wave is coming, Sroto Ganastamaranam Bhajavasudevam. If a wave is coming, I will say I will not get swept away by the wave. But who knows how strong the wave is going to be? If the wave is going to be very strong, I'll get swept away. So instead of thinking I won't get swept away by the wave, let me try to find out if can I have some anchor in my life that I can hold on to and try to tighten my grip on that anchor. It could be my chanting of the holy names, it could be my maybe hearing some kirtans. It could be reading some favorite section from the Bhagavatam. It could be recite. It, it could be just talking with some devotee who, with whom I can open my heart and I can talk at that time. So find an anchor and generally tighten the hold on the anchor. So sometimes we hold on to the anchor, still the waves may come, they may hit us, they may shake us, they may toss us away, but if we have held on to the anchor, we'll come back on track. But if I'm just only focusing on, on oh, I won't, I won't fall to this. But we are all in the Bhava Sagar and one, one implication of being in the material ocean means that we don't know, none of us knows what size wave is going to hit us when. So I may say I have conquered this desire and this is wave is not only in terms of distress. It can also be in terms of temptation. It can be in terms of desire. So I may say I am beyond this anartha. But tomorrow, if a giant wave comes, I might get swept away. So if we focus too much on that aspect, I'll never do this. And then if we end up succumbing to it, then we will think that, oh, my whole life is a waste. I have no willpower. I'm a failure. What is the use of even practicing bhakti? So rather than that, we try to focus on finding our anchor and holding on to the anchor. So if we do these two things, I find that, that it's not that we are neglecting the gravity of some of our lapses, but that we are not letting those lapses uh, lapses become uh, weaken us. So I, I'll just conclude with one more point I mentioned, if I don't mind, sorry. This is say, I am here. Krishna is here. And whatever unhealthy habit I have is here. So I am here. Krishna is here. My unhealthy habit is here. My temptation is here. Ideally speaking, my guilt should come here. It stops me from doing what, what I should not be doing. But unfortunately for most of us, guilt comes here. Guilt comes between me and Krishna. Mm -hmm. It's because I feel guilty, so I end up, what is the use of practicing bhakti? I made this resolution, I couldn't keep it. So what is the use of practicing bhakti? And if guilt is coming between us and Krishna, then that is pseudo guilt. That is, I would say, maya masquerading as guilt and keeping us away from Krishna. So anything that discourages us from Krishna, we have to reject it. And we have to find the association which will and not make us discourage in our practice of Krishna Bhakti. So uh, the guilt is important in its own way, but 
guilt should come between us and our wrong doings not between us and krishna one thing i'm learning from this panel is how much we're blessed by having engineering uh, professionals uh, become the uh, devotees here between the triangle that Yugo Kishore was explaining to us and, and where guilt should lie in our relationship with Krishna. Uh, I think we're really blessed to have people with engineering minds who can analyze it in that way. I'm just going to ask everybody, we started a little late because we, we just kind of dragged a little bit before we had beautiful presentations. We're going to stop promptly at 2.05, but I want to get a quick question in for Madhvacharya and then maybe try to get one in for Yugo before we end. And just very briefly, Madhvacharya, one of the questions that came up was, you mentioned your brother who you used to debate with and how we convinced you. Is, if that brother is, is still with us, if he's still alive, uh, what, what's the nature of your debating today? Uh, how, how's your philosophical conversations with him evolved, have they, over the years? Um, well, he's my oldest brother, and he actually he's one of the, materially, one of the most intelligent men I've ever met in my life. And, you know, I've you know, been around a lot of smart guys, and but he's extremely intelligent, and um he, he became a college professor at University of Tennessee and um, just a, a great, always been a fantastic debater. And um, uh, he became uh, addicted to cocaine and died of a cocaine overdose. Oh, So this is just to say that Intelligence in and of itself is, it can be nice if it's used in the service of devotional service, but otherwise, I just read a study recently that said that, you know, because there's a lot of debate about facts and people, how to convince people of facts. And you would think that the more intelligent you are, the more mm. you can be swayed by a factual argument. But actually, studies have shown that the more intelligent you are, the more adept you are at using, manipulating facts to support your own preconceived notions. Do you understand what I'm saying? So intelligence isn't really, uh, it doesn't really help to help you to be more open-minded and accepting. It's just, uh, uh, it makes you a better manipulator unless it's grounded in a, something a little more substantial. And so, yeah, so just to show you that, you know, and if intelligence isn't grounded in morality and spiritual principle, universal spiritual principle, then it can just take you to, you know, more depths of to deeper depths of despair.